Well, let's take our Bibles and look together in Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah chapter 6, as we continue our reading commentary through the prophet Zechariah. Here in the first part, we have another vision that the Lord gave to Zechariah, and this one has to do with four chariots and their horses. So in verses 1 to 3, we consider what he saw. And then verses 4 through 8, we'll consider what the vision means. But first of all, what Zechariah saw. Verse 1 of Zechariah 6, And I turned and lifted up mine eyes, and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. In the first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot black horses, and in the third chariot white horses, and in the fourth chariot grizzled and bay horses. So four chariots coming from between two mountains. Since the original text actually says the two mountains. And so some would say that one of the mountains represents Mount Zion and the other Mount of Olives, because in Jerusalem, those were two key mountains that existed back in the day. And that's where Zechariah is when the Lord is giving him these visions. Of course, mountains of bronze would associate these mountains with strength. That's one of the symbolisms of bronze and also of judgment, something that can withstand fire. And then we see four chariots or red with red horses, black horses, white horses, and dappled horses, grizzled. They're presented as being very strong steeds. And we already saw horsemen back in Zechariah chapter 1, if you remember. And there they were simply observing, ready, waiting, watching. And here these four chariots and their horses seem to be now in action as what would be considered hostile agents, but of God, of his judgments and his emissaries of war against the earth. That's what horses represent. They're used in battle. And so here the warning is, therefore, that God is bringing forth judgment. Some try to relate this in the book of Revelation to the final days, but the more I study the book of Revelation, the more I see that the horsemen and what was described there as God's judgments was what occurred in the first century when God raised up the armies against Jerusalem and against Israel. And ultimately, the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was destroyed. Well, here we have the same symbolism. Red typically speaks of war. Famine would be represented by black, the black horse, famine and death. And white would represent victory. And grizzled represents pestilence. And there are some references. I'm not just pulling that out of the air, but you can see that in Ezekiel 14, 21, and also the same symbolism in Revelation 6, 1 through 8. What it's showing is that whatever the Lord has purposed to bring against a nation or nations, he's the one directing it. And he is the one who sends war. He sends famine. He sends death. He brings victory. He sends pestilence. All of these things are from his hand. How different that is from how people describe God today. They think, well, he would never do that. That must be Satan doing those things, as if somehow Satan has power that God didn't give him. So what 
the, what does this vision mean? Let's go on then to verses four through eight, because Zechariah himself is eager to understand. And I believe how he's represented here, even being a prophet of God, he desires to be clear on what the word of God is saying. And that's the way it should be for all of us. Seek the Lord, ask him. So then I, I answered he, and said unto the angel that talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And there you can translate the word angel as messenger. And we've been going down through this. The fact that he calls him my Lord to me indicates that this was none other than the Lord Jesus himself. And the messenger angel answered and said unto me, these are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. Same vision as Isaiah had in Isaiah 6, that they were around the throne and ceased not to cry aloud, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And the, the writer of the Hebrews describes these cherubim as those that are at his uh, direction. They go forth as flaming fire. And so the black horses, which are therein, go forth into the north country. And the white go forth after them, and the grizzled go forth toward the south country. And the bay went forth and sought to go, and that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. Then cried he upon me and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. The way that's represented, again, it's the Lord himself being appeased when it says quieted his spirit. God is appeased with judgment. When Christ came and paid the sin debt of his people, God was appeased. That's what it means there that he was the propitiation for our sin. Sin has to be punished and judged. So God is appeased in his son for his elect, but all others he's appeased in their condemnation. There again, a lot of people don't understand this kind of God, but that's what he's describing here. So the four spirits of heaven, it's not like there's there are four holy spirits, but here these are the four chariots which are sent forth. And where you see spirits, those are angelic. So these would be the angels that he sends forth being sent from God. And they do exactly the same as the four horsemen in Revelation 6. The comparison is phenomenal. But here it had to do with in Zechariah's day what was to be expected. And Revelation, again, had to do with what was to take place in the first century because John, when he was given that vision, the Lord said of things which must shortly come to pass. But here, these spirits or angels compared to horsemen on chariots. And the reason is because they ride swiftly as if it were to go throughout the whole world. God is the God of the world. And... Uh, there's no place in the world that escapes his judgment or his direction. And these angels, it's an, another world that we can't even enter into. In fact, we're warned not to try to delve into angels or angelology, but just know that they are at God's beck and call and they do, these are the elect angels. These do what God commands them. And so... That's the picture here. When it says they go to the north country, well, what's north of Israel than Babylon and Assyria? So even though God had used those nations to punish Israel, now in turn, he sends his horsemen, he sends his judgments back to bring judgment upon Babylon and Assyria. And that's where we saw in Daniel's vision where he raised up the Medes and the Persians, first of all, to go against uh, Babylon. And then he raised up the Greeks and then ultimately the Romans. So again, it's a reminder that God is a God of nations. 
And that's what we're seeing here, whether it's to the north or whether it's to the south. The south, what was south of Israel, but Egypt and Libya, those nations that at one time were world powers, and yet God brought judgment down upon them. So it's just a reminder that there's no place where any can escape God's judgment. He is the God of the world. Then in verses 9 through 11, we come back to Joshua, the high priest that we saw already earlier. And now is his crowning. It says in verse 9, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Take of them of the captivity. So Joshua would have been, this would have been a high priest born in captivity, but now brought back after Cyrus's decree that they should come back and rebuild the temple, even of Heldai, of Tobiah, and of Jediah, which are come from Babylon. And come thou the same day and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. What's the Lord doing but reestablishing here the priesthood? It wasn't enough just that the people should come back from captivity, but how God is to be worshipped through that priesthood, that was to continue until Christ should come. And this one Joshua, the high priest, represents then that priesthood, the names that are mentioned here, Heldai in verse 10 of Tobiah and Jediah, which are come from Babylon, Heldai means robust. So this is one that the Lord has raised up and strengthened. Tobiah means God's goodness. The fact that he's raising up this high priest again for the intercession of the people is a manifestation of his goodness. And Jediah means God knows. How does God know? He foresees all things. He's determined the end from the beginning. And so this he is doing for the blessing of the people of the remnant that he brought back from Babylon. And here he's to make an elaborate crown. It says, take silver and gold and make crowns and set them on the head of Joshua. It was typically unthinkable to crown a high priest because priests were never crowned as kings and kings were never priests. And yet, here God has purposed that Josiah or Joshua represent or be a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was both prophet, priest, and king. And this crown, a royal crown, it wasn't customary headdress of a high priest. And so something unusual here, and yet Zechariah does exactly what God declares that he should do. Put it on the head of the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. There already was a strong civil leader in Jerusalem by the name of Zerubbabel. He was the one that was to rebuild the temple. And so it seems like it would have made a lot more sense to crown Zerubbabel instead of Joshua, the high priest. But Joshua was crowned because he was of the lineage of David, and he was of the tribe of Judah, and therefore the coming descendant of David to rule over his people would be none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, prefigured here by the high priest Joshua. In reality, Zerubbabel is a type of Christ as well, but here specifically we see him represented representing Christ as the high priest of God. And you can see that when you read verses 12 and 13, as you continue to read. Here's a prophecy then of the branch who was to be both king and priest. Remember I said, if you wonder about the interpretation of a scripture, just keep reading. Here it is. And speak unto him saying, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts saying, behold, the man, I love that, He's to be a man, come in the flesh, whose name is the branch. 
And I'm glad the translators put the branch all in caps. It leaves no doubt. And he shall grow up out of his place and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Now that's talking about the true temple when Christ should come, not an earthly temple. That earthly temple, even the one that Zerubbabel was to build, was to be destroyed again in 70 AD. But here, it's like Christ said, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it again. He was speaking of the temple of his body. And that's prophesied right here in verse 12. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory. And that's a word that we're going to be looking at in the message tonight on the title of Christ. Christ, the glory of God. That's the word that's used here. And shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne. There's the picture of being priest and king. And the council of peace shall be between them both. He's the wonderful counselor, what? The Prince of Peace, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. So you can't have a more beautiful picture then of what Joshua represents here. I love that. Behold the man. That's how the writer to the Hebrews wrote it. Consider the man. Consider this one who was come in the flesh, God in the flesh. And the branch is associated with fruitfulness and life. And that's who the Lord Jesus is. He uses the same image himself with his disciples in John 15, being the vine and they the branches. But when it says in the Hebrew text, behold the man, the very words that are cited here are the ones that Pilate used to present Christ to the crowd, to the people in Jerusalem when he said the same thing but pronounce it in Latin, behold the man. That's amazing when you consider the context here that Christ was to ascend to that throne, but through suffering, his suffering unto death. And when it says from this, his place, he shall branch out. That's where the branch will go forth. So it's speaking there of the fruitfulness and the spreading of Christ's work and his people through his death. And the temple that he would build, build, well, Paul describes that in Ephesians 2, jointly and fitly framed together on that foundation of none other than Christ, and he would be the priest on his throne. That's the only way to conceive of Christ, prophet, priest, and king. You don't pick and choose. He's all, all three. And then verses 14 and 15, we have the crown as a memorial. It says, in the crowns, shall be to Helam and to Tobijah and to Zediah and to Hen, the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. And they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord, and ye shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass if ye will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Again, this elaborate crown is put in the plural just because of the nature of how it would have been made, but it was made to be a memorial unto the Lord. So here again, the Lord is making it clear that this crown to be placed on Joshua was a picture of the ruling priest king that was to come. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't Joshua who was to take charge of the city of Jerusalem that day. No, the Lord had already raised up others to govern it until he should come. When it mentions Hen, the son of Zephaniah, earlier Josiah was said to be the son of Zephaniah, and Zechariah apparently gave this prophecy in his house over in verse 10 when he spoke it. He was in the house of, you see, go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. And since the name Hen, see all these names are significant. That name Hen means gracious. So this is a word of grace that the Lord is speaking on behalf of those that he purposed to deliver. It was most certainly another name than the one given up there, but nonetheless appropriate because for this Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, he was like Simon and Peter, 
here the Lord is naming him because he's going to be gracious to him. And it says, even those from afar shall come and build the temple of the Lord. We know that that took place in Zechariah's day under the leadership of Zerubbabel. But fast forward again, when Christ came, his spiritual temple to be built, how was it built? Well, through those that he called to himself, to those through those that he redeemed and God justified there at the cross. And it would be built, as it describes here, with those who are far off, sinners from every tribe, nation, and tongue would be brought and made part of this temple. What a beautiful chapter that is. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word. Pray for your blessing. As we continue our time of worship, we marvel just how profound your word is, and at the same time cry unto you for wisdom to know and see Christ in every scripture. We know he's there, but our eyes are so dull many times, and we have such baggage that we bring from our biases that we need you to strip us of all the grave clothes, that we see Christ and Christ alone, and give him the glory. And I give you the praise in his precious name. Amen.